Welcome to the 30th episode of Podcasters. Today with Felix Laumann of Neurospace AI. Felix, welcome. Hey, thanks for having me, Doron. Well, thank you for being here. Please uh, introduce yourself uh, and tell us uh, what you do and what Neurospace does and uh, a little bit more about yourself, how you get into sure. all this business of AI. Sure. Uh, so I'm originally from Germany, from the very south, where there's a strong dialect spoken close to Swiss German. Um, and yeah, I've often studied uh, engineering. I've studied a bit of mathematics, uh, statistics in a PhD, and then really got very interested into the field of language AI. So what that means is ac accurately understanding written language as text, uh, which is, for example, the case or needs to be the case when you interact with a chatbot. But also on the speech side, right? So many people don't have the time to write or don't have the patience or maybe can even, uh, can't even write a certain language, but they can speak it. So we also have been worked and I developed a very strong interest in speech technology, which is most of the time the transcription of someone's voice maybe even of multiple voices. So all of that past interest then really led to um, the establishment of a company that tries to do that as good as possible for as many languages as possible. So um, these technologies have been out for some time and do actually quite well in English, but there are yeah, really hundreds of more languages out there in the world where these technologies are not yet accurate. So with neural space, we try to build accurate language AI for locally spoken languages in Asia and Africa. And, uh, and in Europe? We also and have European you... languages. There are many locally spoken lo European languages. Uh, Flemish is something that we have come across. Galician, Catalan, even Norwegian. There are actually two different dialects in, no in Norway where it's also quite hard to find accurate machine learning models. Um, so we also tackle in the European Union and in the wider Europe those languages. And how do you guys do that? So how do you, how do you get from um, um, a base to all these dialects or all these languages? What, exactly. So what we, was your approach? Yeah, there is an approach that we take that is, I think, fundamentally quite different to the big players, right? So Google Cloud has some offerings that are speech to text, automatic speech recognition, sentiment analysis, a language understanding, and so on. Um, and what I've seen over the last couple of years is that these big tech providers normally try to build first for English and additionally maybe French, German, Chinese sometimes, uh, sorry, Spanish and so on. A few of these kind of what you can call a high resource languages. And they're called high resource languages because they have lots of data available on the internet and whatever. There has been call centers operating in those languages since really lots of years. Um, and then you have that large amount of data and you build a model that is quite large in size, is very data hungry, and then gets fed all that data and then normally performs quite well on it, what means uh, gives very accurate predictions. Um, but then you suddenly move to a language, let's say the Saudi Arabic dialect, right? That is spoken by about 40 million people, actually still quite a lot of people, um, however, there's not as much data on the Internet. So when you compare what is available on the Internet, which is ultimately the training data that we take, there's only about 2% in native Arabic and, I don't know, I think more than 60% in English. So there's a massive shift, and we have then these tiny data that sizes and somehow want to achieve the same functionalities or same capabilities than what we have in English or French. So you need to tackle that problem, and that's what we do at Neurospace from two sides. One, you have that model architecture where you really build a model that's not a, as data hungry, and you try to build that model as data efficient as possible. And then when you have achieved that, at least you have some preliminary good results, you actually then try to maximize your data that size. And at Neurospace, we do that uh, through some kind of um, synthetic data, augmentation or generation, and that's actually what, what lots of company, companies do, but we also generate a lot of data internally. So we have a data collection platform, for example, where at the moment there are more than 100 freelancers working on it and regularly generating data. Some of that we obviously open source because we want to contribute to the community um, on the wider front, but we use all that data as well in our own models. 
So, um, and how many languages can you serve right now? We have uh, just over 100, uh, 107, I think. Wow, and you're expanding every day on new languages. We somehow get to maturity. Um, these languages, I think, yeah, we cover somehow like 99 or 98% of the, pop- of the global population. Um, it is always an interest to expand it uh, because there's still lots of, 2% of the world population are still a lot of people, right? Um, right. But we somehow get slowly to a maturity, I would say. And um, um, if you now look at your application, um, it allows for, that's the, the discussion we had earlier, it allows for inclusivity. And if I, if I look at a lot of chatbots, uh, there's a few things that, uh, and we've come across uh, uh, this subject in uh, a previous uh, podcast, that um, you can hardly call them inclusive. Um, most, uh, most of them speak only one language, uh, whereas if we look at Europe, for instance, most countries are built up not around one language, but are, are multicultural, multilingual, um, and there's very important subjects people should know stuff about in their native language. To understand what's happening, uh, that's one thing. But also for the people that are, if it's speech, who are hearing impaired, make it visual uh, in text. And for people who are visually impaired, uh, make it audible, uh, uh, text to speech. And it's all missing on the, uh, in my opinion, in most uh, chatbots. Uh, also, the most a lot of the tech platforms or um, um, chatbot platforms, they can do it, but they they just yeah, it's not happening. So, um, what do you see happening? What's your vision? If we talk about inclusivity, where this is going, where this should be going? Yeah, it's a very important topic that we try to improve and work on as much as we can. Um, the most, yeah, obvious step is is for me to expand in terms of languages. So. There is, for example, like in any European country, we have a large portion of the population uh, being potentially not born in that country and not as familiar with the native or with the national language. And um, I think it's somewhat of a, almost like a passive discrimination when you don't offer them the services that you have as a very, flu- yeah, a very fluent uh, and potentially even native speaker of that language, right? So let's just assume in the UK, where I now live, uh, applying for something called universal credit, which is somehow kind of a, a social a social security net. Um, yeah, that you can do it in English, and yeah, it is intuitively designed with a nice click-through user flow. However, the people who may also need it actually speak speak not very good English at all, or say say well, would be, feel a lot more familiar and a lot more confident in applying for such a service when they can do it, I don't know, in any other language, in Arabic, in Hindi, in Bengali, whatever, right? So that's something what I find these people should always think about because there is, like, inclusivity, um, a big a big aspect, and I think these people should not... I, like, so my vision overall is that nobody should be discriminated because the language that they speak. That's literally why I started Nerdspace, because I want to build such technology for all languages or for as many languages as possible. And... Yeah, that can be can be still still very very troublesome. I think even for international companies, you don't see it that often. You're very often directed to an English speaking customer call agent or to a chatbot, um, and that's obviously yeah like a big a big issue across. Um, it can be at the front where you think, all right, it's not it's not that influential. So when you have, for example. I don't know, a virtual sales assistant on some kind of e-commerce website, right? Okay, you can live without that in your native language. But there's one example um, that happened during the pandemic in India where people could book an appointment for their vaccination through a WhatsApp chatbot. And that WhatsApp chatbot was in the beginning, I think for at least two months, only available in Hindi and English. So what everyone should know, and probably lots of people know that already, but there are more than 20 officially recognized languages within India, and only one of them is Hindi, right? So English, obviously, people speak who are well-educated, who maybe live in cities and so on. But although these Indian cities are massive, they are not, there's not that the majority of people live. 
And that's not where the majority of people, are the, well, English is not a majority language in India. So there were lots of people, yeah, kind of really disadvantaged and could not book their vaccination appointment uh, because they did not manage to speak Hindi and English. Wow, I didn't know that. Mm. And um, a pity they didn't have your software. Um, <laughs> but um, um, if, if you take one step back, what should happen in order for for chatbots and and these kind of applications, like you said, uh, uh, for instance, for booking a vaccination? Although that's you know that's that's in our past now. Um, what should change? Should we have government regulation or what should happen? It's it's a good point. I think it needs to be tackled from from multiple ends. So, in the European Union. Um, I think there's already a good effort on making or making that technology available in as many languages as possible. So the European Union themselves, like whatever they publish is most of the time, I think in up to 20 languages, uh, which, which is a great first effort, right? Um, when it comes to within country communication, I've not seen like with national governments, I've not seen that much effort. I came across recently one a project by the Italian government where they published or where they are aiming to publish um, governmental documents in a language that's spoken, I think, only like 30, 40,000 people uh, in the north of Italy. And I found that actually very, very interesting. So they somehow are, um, came, came from the perspective it's a, like it's a language that people speak natively that they want to maintain and not that what it dies out. So we speak a lot about in that context um, kind of language, uh, keeping a language is alive, right? But they, they are not dying out. And they recognize that then as, an, as a worthwhile effort to actually publish their documents in that language as well. And I find it actually quite fascinating and would like to see it a lot more. I don't know how the Spanish government is doing it because Spain... With Catalan, they, you mean? They do, okay, okay, yeah. Um, but there's also like Galician and, and Basque, right? So um, I hope there's a lot more effort, a lot more projects around that. But um, um, I, I hope so too. But if we zoom out, uh, um, we would like to have uh, mm. inclusivity by design. Mm. Um, but we know the, fa the fact of the matter is, if you look at the chatbots, it's not. Yeah. Um, so what do, do we need to do as a community or uh, on governmental level, I don't know, yeah. uh, to change that? What, what do you think the next step would be to influence that? Yeah, I, yeah so government regulations, um, if they come from the European Union, great, but even on the country level, I think would hugely help. I also think there should be, and it makes total sense to me, like by a company, there should be actually interest in providing additional languages because they could actually mean to them additional customers. Right. So whatever, if you buy something from, from a Walmart or so, when you actually make your chatbot available in a new language, these people who do not speak English will feel more comfortable in buying from that, from that platform. So I think when people think about that um, and when we with the technology make it fairly easy to provide that additional knowledge, potentially just by a click of the button, make that chatbot available in I don't know, Bengali, additionally to English, um, then then I think there's no, there's really no downside to providing that. And, and how do you manage the, the um, if talk about Bengali or Hindi or, or any yeah. other language, how do you make sure that the, the, the language we see is, is actually um, um, correct? Uh, you know what I mean? Because they're, they're not huge languages. Um, so how do you make sure, how do you check that what is what comes out is actually makes sense. Yeah, we have uh, quite a large number of linguists working with us within the company, uh, and then we have also access. So we just know really well a community of linguists of native language speakers, um, predominantly in India, but also in the Middle East with different Arabic dialects that are actually quite different in nature. Um, and then also across Europe, uh, we have quite a large number of people that we can always contact and have some manual testing on top of the uh, kind of machine generated tests. So you, you, you use native speakers to check on uh, the output, if it actually makes sense. Exactly. We do that very often as an additional step. 
simply because yeah, a test set, however well that's defined, is not covering every edge case, right? And these actually these um, manual tests, I'll say, are trained to go in the edge and really try to find and try to break the system essentially. And and do they succeed? Yeah, but very often they still do succeed. Yeah, I wish I could say no, uh, <laughs> but very often they they still break it and still say that was the wrong classification. Uh, the confidence score of the model is way too high for such an input, but it's very good learning, right? So we take that back and obviously put it into our models, generate new data set and so on. Now, what it tells me is that uh, um, you're not satisfied with the status quo. You, you, you're continuously improving yeah. uh, uh, the product out there in order to, to give the users the best possible experience. Which, of course, is important if, uh, because as a company, you don't speak Bengali. You have no clue if the chatbot is actually telling the, the right story to, the, to, to this customer or yeah. potential customer. Um, if you, if you started this company out of sort of frustration and idealism. Uh, yeah. uh, maybe frustration is the wrong word, but it, it's some sort of idealism that you want this, you know, w want inclusivity. Yeah. Um, if you look at the AI Act of Europe, I don't know if you uh, you checked it, and we, we met, of course, in uh, in Edinburgh, mm -hmm. um, where also the EU uh, representative of the EU was speaking. Um, do you feel that in the AI Act um, there there is enough touch points to to create this change? And if yes, how? Yeah, so I haven't read the AI Act in detail. Um, I've read about it's it. Very, it's very long. It is very long, <laughs> belief as well, yeah. Uh, I've obviously read news, <laughs> newsletter, uh, sorry, newsletters and newspaper articles and heard interviews and so on. Um, I saw, however, as well, and I believe that's part of the AI Act, um, a call by the European government, like a, a grant, a research grant call for having a large language models with European values. And that was, that was very interesting. So the coverage of any kind of European uh, local language was part of it, besides like transparency, fairness, uh, respect, and so on. So that was very interesting. I, if it goes far enough, hard to hard to say, very very hard to say beforehand. Um, it's definitely a step in the right direction. And uh, um, did you see any use cases recently, or, or not so recently, but use cases where? You you saw that they they solved the inclu inclusivity. They they did a good job. Did you did you see that anywhere? Where I was out. Where did I? Not, well, no, not also, no, it's also <laughs> so an I, answer. You, you probably already now realize how I react. No, so I haven't because otherwise it would immediately jump to my mind. Um, no, not really. Actually, not no. Uh, um, uh, I can't name anyone uh, uh, an example either, uh, but that's also the worrying part that we, yeah. we we we're in the business and we can't name one that we think is inclusive. Yeah. Yeah. I think it um, has, it has multiple reasons why why that's not yet happening. And um, one is what I hear a lot with with chatbots that they are frequently updated. So companies want to automate another workflow where then the chatbot takes over what have been so far handled by by a human agent. And I think also from our side, right, how do we design our bot building experience for these customers? Um, it must be relatively easy to update a chatbot in, let's say, I don't know, 20 languages at once, right? So potentially the, the flow and the, the absolute base is only in English or whatever, only in German or Spain, wherever the, wherever the, um, the bot is hosted and, and uh, used for. Um, but then there must be somehow, like I don't know, when you t generate new data, there must be automatically a button, please make that data also available in Spanish, uh, sorry, in whatever, Catalan or Basque, um, or in Arabic or any other language, and then automatically retrain the, the engine to have a very strong um, NLP also available in that other language. I think it's at the moment still a lot of effort to keep multiple languages of the same chatbot live. And it's probably part of the part of the reason. And you think that's a technical problem or that's uh, just because the, the conversation designers and writers are just not used to designing in and for different languages? I, you know, I think that 
the conversational designer should not even um, should not even be worried about designing in an additional language. Like if it's not something like strongly cultural that is being communicated, which is in I think in ninety nine percent of the chatbots, it's not anything that is super culturally embedded and like you don't want to have like huge charisma and you don't want to uh, make any kind of culturally acquainted jokes or comments. You want to solve like solve a problem and and for that you, know, you, you mean it's functional it's and functional. it helps you exactly. from it helps you from A to B. The communicate like the language the chatbot speaks back is relatively simple. It's functional, it's clear, it's direct, right? So it wouldn't take too much effort and the conversational designer is probably not the person who should worry about it. That person should click then make me make the chatbot available in five more languages, but they should not start again drawing some some conversational flows and all. It should be somehow like intrinsic in the technology platform. And if you look at the cost of making uh, your chatbot multilingual, I can well, let me give the context. Mm -hmm. I can imagine that uh, knowing that chatbot projects can be expensive, uh, take a long time to get to the level where you want them to be. That the the fear is that if you make a multilingual, let's suppose the the the, the, the conversational AI platform uh, allows you to do that. Mm -hmm. um, that it's, it's expensive to be multilingual. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that is a myth. Yep. Um, maybe you can help me debunk that myth. Um, I think inclusivity is actually cheaper, inclusivity by design in the end, than um, um, doing it later on language after language. Yeah. But, but you know more about this. Yeah. How do you view this? Yeah, it can be very expensive. I, I, I get that point when you really need to start designing a new conversational flow where you need to annotate your training data again, where you first of all need a, like a translation agency to translate your data set and all of that. It, it, it's skyrocketing costs, definitely. Um, but I think we as conversational AI practitioners, technology providers, we can actually make that step much easier. Um, when we have some, let's say, automatic translation of training phrases with annotated intents, with annotated entities within the training set, then that entire step could be taken care of, right? And the translation from lots of use cases doesn't need to be perfect because you are anyways not looking for a perfect match, right? You want that the model develop some knowledge about that intent. And then when you have per intent, let's say a hundred training phrases, uh, it doesn't need to be a perfect translation because the model learns to generalize from it, right? So that should be all. It should be all doable. Um, yeah, I find it can have skyrocketing costs when you need to start from scratch for each language. But yeah, I haven't come across yet a bot design platform that is really kind of so simple to expand to a new language, like almost like clicking an additional button. In which language do you want to have such a bot? English, French, Spanish, German. And here I'm live with four, with four different chatbots in four languages. And, and what, what should happen uh, in order to get there? I think the inclusivity needs to be on, the, on a higher priority list of chatbot development platforms. Um, any platform like LivePerson, Haptic, um, Druid, whatever is out there, right? They need to have a the forefront of their of their efforts, at least a lot higher on the priority list, that multilingual chatbots can be made more easily and quicker available than they have been so far. That, that's my my view on it. Um, it may be high on the priority list, but I just I just haven't seen it yet, like in a really simple way, live. So um, um, I'm, I'm trying to picture this. Basically, what you're saying is you have a, a, a conversational AI platform where you build your bot, yeah. um, uh, no code, low code, or a bit of code, whatever. Um, and basically, you say we integrate the language model. Mm -hmm. um, and in the design, you, you create a button where the consumer, where either it recognizes the language you're, type, you're typing, and it changes to that language. Um, and when you say uh, when it's an English bot and you say uh, in French, uh, do you speak French? Mm -hmm. And then it recognizes it's French and then it just switches to French. I'm just an example. Um, 
uh, that's what you have in mind. Exactly. That, and, and that it happens at the back end and that uh, either it recognizes or you click a flag for a language or sure. select a language from a, from a list. Yeah. So from the conversational designer perspective, I envision that there is a platform where you design your flow, where you upload or generate your training data for each intent, where you annotate your entities. And you can do that in one language. That's a language of your choice. Um, which is actually very often very often English. Um, however, then afterwards, right? So what do I do if I want to generate the same or when I want that set bot also understands Hindi? Um, what I've seen a lot is that people just put a machine translation model for each Hindi input. So Hindi will be always translated to English and then and then the English and then just the English text goes through the model and then it's back translated from English again to Hindi. And that I call it an intermediate translation. Actually, lots of information is lost, and especially from the translation back from English to Hindi. Um, yeah, lots of, very often the user the, of the chatbot actually doesn't understand what what is the output. So, what I have in mind how that problem could be tackled more easily is when I have my conversational flow and I only maintain one conversational flow, one conversational diagram. I have for each intent, let's say, 100 training phrases. And that training phrase, um, or all these training phrases, are then automatically translated into another language of my choice. And that happens for the conversational designer. They don't need to do anything. They just say, make that bot available in Hindi, additionally to English. So I have a back, in, like a backdoor translation between English and Hindi, the training phrases, which don't always need to be 100% accurate. And then I also have automatically in the translated sentence, I have my entities annotated and I have a label for my intents. And then I just have a second model. Then I train that again, right? When you have everything prepared, you train the English model. In parallel, you would train the Hindi model. And then it's really simple for a chatbot for the, for the user perspective. There will be a language detection model and then points the user to the right NLU model. And that's really, I think, all what needs to be done. It's just that that parallel training of multiple languages in the back end, which can be activated through a clicking uh, through a tick box for the conversational designer. I haven't seen that in any platform um, integrated yet. Uh, th th that's interesting, because if we talk about inclusivity by design, yeah. Um, I would assume that uh, it makes total sense to have that in your platform. Yeah. Um, so probably if we talk about legal changes in, on the EU level, which mm -hmm. may, might take some time, um, if, if inclusivity by design is, is mandatory, then it's a, it's a non-issue. Um, would be good for your business, by the way. <laughs> but because uh, um, um, I haven't seen... And maybe I've, I haven't looked properly, but I haven't seen many platforms around that do what you do. Uh, is that correct? Or, or are there, I mean, I, I know there are some platforms that, that do translations yep. and, and extract data. Um, um, they're there. But uh, over 100 languages and the dialects, it's, uh, uh, but the, it, it, who are you, your competitors? Yeah, the, so the, the big tech providers, the cloud providers like Azure, Microsoft Azure, Cognitive Services, Google Cloud, uh, AWS, IBM as well, they expand on languages and we see quite um, quite yeah, an expansion over, over the last few years. Um, we still have a bit of an edge. I think Google is the second one that has a lot of, lot of different languages. Um, it also then depends very much on the accuracy of these locally spoken languages, right? You can offer a model in Afrikaans. Um, however, if, if you get like 20 or 40% accuracy, on the model, it's, well, it's not production ready and it's evil. useless. It's useless, yeah, if you want to say it that way. Um, so it depends very much how accurate are you, can you build for these locally spoken languages? And yeah, when we compare that, their uh, neural space has still quite a significant edge versus these competitors. Uh, but yeah, they're catching up and like, we try to expand in languages, we try to become more accurate, obviously. So yeah, it's, it's all basically. So that's how you stay ahead. I hope so. <laughs> and um, um, if you look at the, 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 the recent news, the things that are happening in the world, um, 
and you could select a, a situation or a product or anything where where your solution uh, would be useful um, or inclusivity would be useful or wise what would you, what would you select what use case would you change very very good point uh there are too many that I could only pick one. Uh, what I find, what I find very interesting is voice-to-voice -voice translation, just in terms of a communication between cultures, essentially, right? So I think lots of conflict in the world is just because people don't understand each other. Um, this goes from like racism to political relationships, exactly to anything. Yeah. So um, if we have very accurate nearly real-time voice-to-voice translation that would be a game changer i think it, it it is technically a challenging problem right because you need to have very accurate speech to text um in a language that has not much data then you need very accurate machine translation again for a language that doesn't have much data and then the text to speech would probably be fairly straightforward i think nobody would mind if it sounds still a bit robotic doesn't have too much um of, of charisma and and emotions but these first two steps, they are technically very challenging. Um, that is one that I, what I like a lot. Um, and in what use case would you, would, you, would you fit that in? Yeah, there is one. So I, I love exploring the world myself. So I love, I love traveling. I try to interact with, with any kind of local resident as much as I can, even when I just walk across the market somewhere in Vietnam or so. Um, I would love to speak to these people more. Um, this is something what I would do, but obviously it can like political discussions, um, panel discussions, any kind of yeah international high level meetings. I think there will there will be huge improvements. Or conferences, uh, conferences stuff like that. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, that's uh, um, and if you look at uh, um, YouTube, for instance, so you see uh, YouTube has. Um, uh, if you put in a, like for our, our podcast goes online and then YouTube uh, puts a, you can put a transcript underneath or LinkedIn does it as well. And it's not always uh, very, um, how should I say, it, it sometimes misses words uh, or, or puts them uh, in a speech to text in the, in the wrong way. Um, but what I would, would really enjoy is that I can select a button with a button. So, you know, give me uh, Dutch subtitles or, or anything else. Uh, automatically, I agree. And, co and correct. Um, I, I, I know technically it's possible, but uh, uh, we don't get the option. Uh, I know there's something that does it in uh, Microsoft Teams in meetings. Uh, it, it transcribes and translates. Yeah, there are even for for Google Meet. I've seen it. Um, it's obviously that kind of thing. So how fast do you make it available? So how how close to live you make it available? Uh, because then you need to have models that are not very big, that can process data very fast. Um, but these models are normally not that accurate, right? So you have a bit of a trade-off between accuracy and speed. Um, yeah, there, there's no doubt we will get to the level where we have nearly live transcriptions plus translations um, in in very high accuracy. But yeah, it still takes some research effort. And, and I, uh, y your company recently introduced uh, uh, this week or last week some new uh, uh, features. Uh, and I thought that was interesting as well because you uh, basically what you can do is extract data from documents and translate it. Yep. Um, but if you look at, it, again, a lot of government documents um, where, for instance, expats or refugees need to do stuff, it's for governments extremely difficult and expensive to to translate everything and, and make sure it's correct. Um, and would the what the technology you just introduced would that be able to solve those problems? To a large extent, yes. So we have seen that problem where, um, yeah, government departments or banks, financial institutions, when they need to do some kind of background checks. Um, they get a scan or very often when you open a new account somewhere um, and you have a verification right through your phone you take a picture of something then it's uploaded um, and very often there's still a human and checking oh is that date of birth is that correct what he has on the passport and so on so when you take a picture the data can be automatically extracted 
in whatever format or in whatever layout that document is, right? So passports are standardized, it's not that difficult, but taking a receipt from every restaurant, you have a different kind of layout of the receipt, or then even going to more complex documents like, I don't know, a birth certificate, which is in Germany, for example, still printed and nowhere digital, um, that looks different for every country. So for university degrees. University like degrees. Uh, recently we worked on a project where we had uh, CVs, and obviously every person designs a CV slightly different. So when it comes to that layout independent or layout um, agnostic extraction, there has not been that much uh, technology yet in place. And we saw also huge huge demand for that in the Middle East, where that data extraction is not that accurate for Arabic. So we thought with our capabilities and with our knowledge in those local languages, we could probably build something quite efficient. And what it was in the end is actually a combination of two services that are already available on the neural space platform. So we did an OCR that was anyways available on neural space. And then on top of the extractor text from the OCR, we did an entity recognition. So just what word is a name, what word or what phrase is, let's say, a company name, what number or combination is a date, and all of these things. So um, it wasn't that much of an effort, but it was a really nice way how we can solve a given problem through a combination of, of services that are already available. Yeah, because you, you told me about a project you did in somewhere in an Arabic language. I forgot the country. Um, and I thought that was amazing, um, and, and it was quite successful. Maybe you can elaborate on that as a use case for, uh, f not so much for your tech, but for the tech in general. Yeah, so uh, what we, yeah, we have had a few, a few projects now in the Middle East, but one which I find uh, quite exciting is the document processing when you open um, a corporate bank account. And what essentially happens is that... Um, Every bank has slightly different requirements, what they want to have as a verification, as a proof that the company is valid, that they can have a company or corporate bank account. And then also these documents come in all kinds of forms, right? So when I have incorporated my company in the UK, um, I can actually open a bank account at that, at that given bank in the Middle East. Um, however, my corporate, uh, sorry, my certificate of incorporation looks very different to a certificate of incorporation in the Netherlands or in Saudi Arabia or in the UAE. So they need to have something that is kind of, again, like layout independent or information extraction that is not only designed for one given layout. And yeah, it was in the end not, not too difficult information that we extracted, like, yeah, shares in the company. Um, incorporation date and so on. But we need to provide in multiple languages, right? Arabic, obviously, English, uh, and a few more. And yeah, it was saved them now a lot of time in, to, in the corporate onboarding process. And uh, the, 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 the value you create by doing that, um, it, yeah, how, how does that incorporate in the in the processes, because uh, I understand there's a tra traditional way of doing things. Yep. We always did it this in this way. And now all of a sudden you come in with a uh, with certain tech and it's not being done by humans anymore. Uh, how, did, how did you, or how did the people you work with, how did they create the change? Because that, yeah. that is a hard thing to do. Yeah. So it, in fact, uh, um, it's still, it's not done by humans anymore, but it's still verified by a human. So there was a lot of, that's like what people would call admin work that they need to do, which means like when there's a, corp, when there's a com company onboarding, they spend less time with the customer. They spend more time on typing in the information into predefined fields. And that is actually, that's actually missing out, right? Because like, why is there a human? Because there can be a human face to the cu customer experience, which a company values in the end of the day, because they feel like the person is approachable, I can easily ask questions, and it means for the bank, um, I can potentially sell more, right? Maybe that customer needs a loan, maybe the customer needs, I don't know, five more credit cards. Um, so it is actually helpful for, the, for that onboarding manager because they just can give away a large portion of their, what they have called admin work to a machine and just need to verify the information in the end. So what's your take on uh, on um, AI 
And there was this report, yeah. uh, I think it was Goldman Sachs, but a report about saying that AI was going to replace so many jobs. As the way you just described it, it's not replacing jobs, it's creating space to actually address customers. Yeah. So how, how, what's your take on that? Yeah. So, I, like, yeah, people say, or think, like the machine takes away my job, and it may take away the jobs that you have been currently doing. Um, but I think there's plenty of room in how we do things at the moment, plenty of improvement possibilities where these people then will hopefully be, be used and um, will work, right? So, I don't know, let's say a doctor, right? Like how much time do I actually sit in front of the GP and they are filling out some forms? It's, I don't know, for me, it's 70, 80%. Whenever I go to a GP, they're actually sitting in front of computer typing and I sit there and, and be quiet, right? So how much time could there be spent when they actually then like talk to me or when they actually can serve more, more, um, more patients, more patients. So I don't think it will take away, but like free up people and some who maybe are also not open to a change in their work environment. Okay, potentially that job is replaced. Um, but I've also read um, a report on basically like the history of um, industrial revolutions, essentially. And yeah, like we are still, we still have, like, I don't know, in, in the UK, there's maybe now 5% unemployment rate, right? Um, it was actually higher in the, in the previous iterations of industrial revolutions. And yeah, we are still, we are just doing something new, but whoever is open to doing something new or changing their work environment should probably not suffer, right? Um, it's just the current, the current, um, yeah, overview of jobs that may get some of them get lost. So are you saying then that uh, a professional should embrace uh, the use of AI and not uh, be scared of it and, and just learn how to use it? Exactly. So there was the, uh, there was also a famous quote. I don't know <laughs> who said it, but uh, like AI will not take your job, but the people who use AI will take your job. Um, that's to some extent right, I would say. And I had this whole discussion with uh, 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 in the medical field yeah. where uh, you could say if a doctor who doesn't, it, there's doctors asking, uh, is, am I going to be replaced by AI? Yeah. And then the answer was uh, uh, no, but the doctors who are not using AI to become a better doctor, yeah. um, they will be replaced by the doctors who actually use the AI. Yeah. Um, so you, you make yourself obsolete by not using it yeah. and become a better uh, and more efficient yeah. um, medical practitioner. Um, and I find that an interesting statement, but it mm. confirms uh, what you're saying. Exactly. You need to embrace instead of fight it. Yeah. Although some carefulness is uh, uh, mm. important. We saw this letter, uh, um, Elon Musk and uh, B Bill Gates and uh, uh, the, the, one of the founders of Apple. Um, how do you view that, uh, putting the brakes on AI? Yeah. In the first reaction is, I don't like it. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's my my very first like my gut feeling. I think, Ooh, but, but why, right? Um, there is a there is a risk. No no doubt. Um, technology can get into yeah into into awful hands, and and a lot of harm can be done with it. Um, I I don't know if it would actually make a difference. So what like just go through the scenario. We put a break on AI. Okay, who will take a break? Who will actually implement it? Right any kind of government enforced organization, which is anything that is um, obviously publicly funded, universities, uh, private companies as well, right? Like anyways, the latest research in NLP, our field comes from private companies because they have the resources. But well, like some organizations who will not be that transparent about it, let's say some countries in this world, well, for them it would be, would be some time to catch up it would be some time to actually do some more research where everyone else is kind of somewhat putting a hold on it and then potentially have, have an edge, right? So I don't think it's it's practical to implement such a stuff. It will be implemented in organizations that may not even have harmful intentions with the AI, right? There is an entire stigma around the AI will become Kind of self-aware and then just build more intelligent AI, um, which 
may not also have actually bad intentions because like from from a technical perspective that AI will still have some kind of optimization function, right? So what it should actually achieve, which which should be kind of predefined and, and probably hard coded. <laughs> I don't know in what way you realize it, but when you are not saying that objective should be whatever, kill all people, then it should probably not have that bad of intentions, right? Um, yeah, I'm not, I don't think you can realize it, first of all, like practically realize it. And I don't know if it's, yeah, if it's really the right step to take. But uh, we saw Italy uh, yeah. uh, moving and, uh, and uh, putting a lock on uh, chat GPT yeah. uh, for privacy reasons. Yeah. Um, uh, it's an interesting uh, thought, but uh, if there's a privacy problem, that's what you put in. So someone put something in and that's somehow your own responsibility. Mm. Um, I don't think innovation, this innovation can be stopped or should be stopped. Um, but I do understand and I appreciate uh, the, the warning from the letter yeah. is that we should be incredibly careful um, with the output because um, uh, although AI has been around quite a long time, people don't realize it, but already since the 80s, uh, they've been building on AI and it's only now that we're at the level that we can actually use it yeah. properly. Yeah. Um, and I say properly within uh, um, mm. the the you know, the, the, the brackets. Yep. Um, because the, the, it still produces a lot of bullshit. Mm. But, 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 um, um, I also see that the bullshit is produced based on the bullshit input. Mm. Um, so there, there's this whole discussion um, about learning how to prompt and that, you know, the, the profession of the future is... Uh, understanding how to talk to artificial intelligence in order to get the right mm. output. So uh, becoming a prompting engineer or whatever you want to call it, mm. uh, they're talking about it. Um, but I think that starts in school. Yeah. Um, uh, and um, um, that's another thing I find with AI, that schools are um, sort of forbidding to use AI instead of embracing it and say, okay, we know it's around, it's going to happen. Mm. It's like telling kids, no, 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 you have to do everything uh, not on the computer mm. because, um, you know, it's okay to have a computer, but they're not functional. Mm. No, they are, and they're basically 100% of your life. Mm. So um, nowadays they teach programming in high schools, so why not prompting? Mm. And... Um, so, that, but not only in schools. I think in universities and uh, in research institutions, same thing. You need to embrace and understand and follow and and grow with the models because that's that's the whole point. If you get in late, then you sort of miss the development and the understanding. And having said that, um, how do you view your application or your your the way you look at things in um, in universities, because basically your technology would allow me, it's hypothetically, but if you you have a university in, I don't know, a Prague, mm -hmm. that has a, a certain course in university in, a, in their native language, uh, a Czech, I think it's, uh, they speak there. Yep. And so I could follow the, the, the university course uh, in Czech, but in English, yep. having it translated directly and being able to ask my questions. Aren't we also, uh, is your technology, I'm, I'm asking the wrong question, but wouldn't your technology allow uh, uh, to democratize knowledge yeah. much more than it is now? 100%. So when there is really the University of Prague offering a program that is, whatever, communicates such, such important knowledge or such knowledge that I really want to have, like, why should you be excluded from accessing it because you don't speak the language? Right? Like, when there is that one expert professor who has been doing research in, I don't know, economic history for one certain country, Czech Republic, over the last 200 years, and you are super interested in that, yeah, why do you need to learn Czech before, right? Before actually being able to access that knowledge. So, and this is something about what I'm really passionate about. I don't think anyone should be disadvantaged because they don't speak that language. And yeah, that's that's one really one big reason why, why I started Neurospace and why we are by far not yet at that level where that's all reality. 
Um, it just it means for me in the end we need to push accuracy of these locally spoken language models a lot a lot further uh, to get to that to get to that level. Well, that's uh, well, I find that promising because um, if 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 you're about and we're all about democratizing knowledge and information, mm. um, I think then it would. Uh, well, we've proven in, in COVID time that uh, uh, learning from a distance is possible, get, uh, getting in a university degree or whatever. So we can do it. Yeah. So if, if it can be done online, um, then we can integrate technology to translate yeah. um, and also doing exams that way. Yeah. So I can imagine that in the future that we, we don't have... A, we don't study at one university or one educational institute. We just pick what we want to learn and what we need to learn and, and collect from all over the world. 100%. And I think there is, right, you've probably done that as well. You're very fluent in English and you speak probably Dutch and maybe more languages. When you watch yeah. a movie in English that is recorded in English, and then in Germany at least we do lots of overdubbing, right? And then you watch the same movie in German with the German voice actors overdubbing. It's somewhat of a different movie. And I understand that people say, okay, we need to keep these languages uh, language alive and the kind of the originality that comes with that language. But I don't think education requires that, right? Re education is in terms of set, in terms of emotion. It's very dry and very, yeah, very stale and, and plain, right? So education is a brilliant example of where Dutch technology could be very, very successfully being used, in my opinion. So if you think about Dutch students having to study in English, uh, being brought up in a farm somewhere, and then all of a sudden you have to do everything in English, that sort of makes their life difficult. Uh, uh, and I would highly appreciate if um, the Dutch universities would say, okay, well, you know, we teach in Dutch. Uh, and of course, some courses can be in English because they're internationally oriented, oriented which makes perfect sense. Um, but basically in Dutch, and if there's a foreign student, we'll take care of through a translation program or whatever to to translate it and so they can study in their own language in Holland um, with all the, 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 the good things. Um, part of it, in my opinion, should be done that way, and that's also the way uh, you preserve a language because one of the things we see is that... Um, I don't know. Again, I don't know what it's like in Germany. I think in England will be min less of a problem because everything is in English automatically. But if you um, uh, start learning in English, then the German, the quality of your German, you know, goes yeah. south if everything is in English. So what I see is that uh, uh, students that graduate from university or apply to uh, universities. Um, their Dutch capabilities, and I'm, I'm, I'm horrified to say this, the grammar-wise, are, are not at par, uh, not something you would expect from a university student or an applied, uh, applied university student. And, and, and that worries me because language is our main conduit to, to, to transfer knowledge or get things done. Um, so uh, I don't have the solution, but maybe uh, um, bringing the learning back to Dutch, the studying back to Dutch, uh, and then translate for those who need it uh, would be a better solution. Um, yeah. Having said that, on the other hand, teaching English allows also to get professors from other countries, um, and that brings also positive cultural differences yeah. in the study. So the, there's, a, the, there's a pro and a con, but I think language-wise, and to maintain languages, uh, you need to learn that language or study in that language. And, uh, but I, I'm not an expert in this field. This is just an, an opinion. No, it's, it's a very good point. Um, I find also with yeah? language, there's culture being, um, being kept alive, right? So there's a lot of influence how, how people speak about it, how they influence it. Um, yeah, it is, it is an, and it's an interesting problem. Um, it, yeah, in, in, my, in my utopia, there are there's no dependence on, on language whatsoever. Um, and this would be the idea. So everyone could actually like, yeah, study in their, in their mother tongue, wherever that university is. And this would just yeah, allow everyone to access knowledge. So maybe in a few years' time, we have the University of the <laughs> World, where you can study in any, any language at any university or any University of Applied mm -hmm. Sciences. Um, 
uh, in your own uh, mother tongue, um, but it's a local course. That would be amazing, actually. Um, looking forward to that. Um, I, I might go back to studying then. Um, yeah, that, but there's lots of stuff I, I would like to study, but it's, you know, um, you would like to take courses, and, and it's nice if you can do it in your own language. That sort of speeds things up. Um, if you look at the future of, uh, of chatbots and conversational AI, so how do you see that? It's interesting. So the, the field got a, kind of a, a lot of a lot of interest recently, right? Through ChatGPT, where suddenly everyone kind of says, "Wow, that's actually possible." Before, I saw kind of often um, companies saying, "Okay, that's something." So they did not even believe that they can automate a certain task with a conversational AI solution because they were just saying, "Okay, my chatbot is a nice right bottom website greeting button," then popping up, then hi. Um, and that's basically all it can do, obviously, in an exaggerated way. Um, but suddenly they came kind of said, oh, wow, that's actually what this technology is able to do. So there's a lot of interest at the moment. And um, what people are able to build with it is also quite, quite, quite fascinating. So I see kind of a lot of, lot of trends going towards that um, enterprise chatbot, internal knowledge chatbot um, that is kind of, yeah, potentially just like a help desk that can answer all kind of questions, but also some kind of um, well, digital twin of an employee to have somewhat of the knowledge of the employee, right? So something like that could be um, could be more, more, more often being built, I believe. Where the entire field goes is it's a super tricky question. I, yeah, I'm, I'm really focused on, on these like local markets, right? So, um, I can guess where in India and where, uh, where in the Arabic speaking countries <coughs> we see trends going. Overall, as a global, global industry, it's it's hard to say. I hope a lot more voice because it's just more intuitive for me. It's the next the next level of human-like interaction with a computer, instead of typing, we can now speak. Um, then the next step will hopefully be including what is called in a machine learning language, multimodal. So maybe all the camera can see me, can see my face expression, can see my hand expression, can maybe see me pointing towards something. Um, that would obviously be the next step on the, on the human-like ladder, if you want to call it that way. Um, but yeah, there is yeah, too many different trajectories where, where everything could go and all the too many research fields that somehow need to be combined at some step, right, to extract kind of that full full potential of what humans are able to comprehend. But the speed at which we are going now, uh, forget that uh, they're putting the brake on AI, yeah. Let, let's assume they're yeah. not. Um, uh, I don't think what you just called uh, uh, what you yeah, what you, you your view on the future is not that yeah, far away. Because be uh, there's already a lot of uh, models uh, being multi-model, yep. multi, okay. uh, yeah, and uh, uh, they're being built as we yep. speak. Okay. It's, um, still, it's just. It's still, still like there, there is a channel challenge um, in how that how this multiple models or multiple dimensions of information communication can be very efficiently being combined to understand like we do, right? Like almost like instantly I know how you feel because of your facial expression, right? And what you say, and I can, I can interpret sarcasm uh, really well, although I don't know you very well, right? Which is still very challenging for any computer. So I think there's still something to do, like how different sources of information can be very intelligently be combined and one one conclusion being drawn from it but definitely there's lots of effort and and yeah it may not be that far away yes um and i would not be surprised if your uh, your solutions would play a big role in that uh, and, and of, of course companies like yours um, um democratizing uh, and, and and creating inclusivity in in, in chatbots and speaking about inclusivity of chatbots, uh, we have a few chatbots ready to test, and I'd love to uh, um, go over them with you and see uh, what they do. Um, I will share my screen. Hold on. 
Let's. Uh, which which one shall we do? Shall we do um, HSBC? Let's go to five. So UK Bank. Um, you see the HSBC, yes, right? Yes, I'm mobile. Your virtual assistant. Um, okay. Then, okay. So we see here, hi, I'm mobile, your virtual assistant. To get started, just click on one of the buttons below. Um, and it says an error. I don't know why. Maybe because it's been open for a while. Huh. Uh, interesting. Here we go. Poof. You heard that? Yes. Hi, I'm Mobi, your virtual assistant. To get started, just click on one of the buttons below. Uh, accounts, products, payments, cards, digital banking, get in touch. And it starts with the fact that it's one language. Yeah. It doesn't say uh, choose a language. That's one thing. So, Although, uh, just try to type something in Dutch. I don't know if it has some language detection capabilities. So I will ask him, do you speak speak French? Okay, it says, hi, thanks for using chat. Oh, <laughs> thanks for using uh, chat. <clears throat> Our chatbot mobile will be happy to help you to keep you safe. You don't share personal information, which is a good thing to say. Like your full account number of card details, just so you know, we sometimes provide links to external websites and record and track conversations to help improve your experience. Uh, and then it gives you a link to the privacy uh, rules. Um, that's actually good. Um, and then it, please select your query from below. And then it gives a whole list of buttons I can choose. Account, product opening, getting in touch, global money, help with my card, help with my secure key, managing my account, mortgage information, online mobile banking, payments and transfers, unrecognized transaction, unusual account activity, I have a different inquiry. Um, which one would you like, would you like me to try? Well, it would be interesting if you actually type something like, Payments, just payments, and let's see if it actually detects. Let's see if it recognizes. It. So I, I don't, I don't read well, um, so uh, I'm a bit uh, of a pain for them. And then it says, uh, interesting. I said payments. Then it gives you uh, a list of options connected to payments. So it, it does read and tries to understand what I'm trying to say. Um, but it doesn't go into a conversation with me. Yeah. This is, I find that interesting. It, you know, it's service oriented, but very, very functional. Yeah. So it says here, please choose your inquiry from the list below. How can I pay my credit card? How can I cancel a direct debit? How do I make a transfer and a whole yeah. list of uh, it, things. Just, like, think about my customer experience, right? Like, or your experience now, um, instead of using your natural language, which a chatbot is, in my opinion, capable to do, you need to go through the options, right? Um, and that's something where people get dissatisfied and say, okay, let me just call someone. I can. I don't need <coughs> to read 10 things to select one. I can just say it and the person knows what I mean. Um, so that's where people get unsatisfied, I believe, and that's totally understandable. So I think there could be a lot more done on the uh, kind of understanding capabilities and just none of the above is one option, right? The last option. If yeah, they probably have implemented something like that to guide the user more, but then, yeah, just return. Sorry, we can't, we can't, uh, we can't follow, we can't fulfill your your query. Yeah, what I what I when I look at this, um, I understand they want to guide you through the process, mm -hmm. but having me read all these options, uh, and not once but twice, yeah. and maybe even a third time. Um, um, isn't there a more direct line straight from my problem to an answer or to a process that answers my question? So it's exactly what you say. If, if, if it recognizes what I say here, um, and they might have had trouble or that tech stack might not allow them to do that properly, and this is an easier way, it recognizes and then they, they, they create a list uh, based on that because uh, that's the, where most people come for um, to make it 
easier or something. But uh, uh, I agree with you. It's too much information and uh, it makes you want to get someone on the phone and solve my problem instantly. Yep. So I shall try none of the above, see what it does. I would assume it goes back to the main menu. Okay. Let's see what it does. And it actually does. <laughs> um, so which one do you want to try? Because uh, apparently we can type all we like. Uh, I'll see what I do. If I said get in touch, let's see what it does. I'm just curious if it recognizes. <laughs> If you're an existing HSBC customer, please chat with us on the HSBC mobile banking app. Alternatively, here are some other ways you can contact us. This is really annoying that they give everything in a separate message. Yeah. And then it says the window, the, the, the link, and then it says, thanks for contacting us today. Oh, that's the end of it. Thank you. So I'll ask for menu. See what it does. And well, that, this is actually good. <laughs> you ask for the menu and you get the menu Hello. again. So what, uh, uh, which one do you want to try? Let's go global money. Global money. Okay. We clicked on global money and it's, it's interesting. It says agent is typing someone now, someone now is actually there. Uh, and we know it's, no. uh, <laughs> it's automatic. Um, it says, thanks for your inquiry about global money to find out more information. Please visit the web page below. Um, and then have I resolved your query? I don't even have time to <laughs> click on the link. Uh, uh, um, so so it's, it's a brilliant example. That, that, that they don't take the chatbot capability. So first of all, they don't exploit what chatbot is able to do. What do they know to able to do? What means understanding a lot more what, you, what users actually want and try to find a solution. They see it as an additional channel for this or for directing a customer to a certain website, right? And then the action should be taken on that website. So when you click on that website, maybe there's somewhere a field about how you can get in touch with someone from the global money team. I don't know. Yeah. That's why. And, and this is... So you see, you see it now, the different screen or not? No, not yet. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, the, the, I understand. It won't work. Otherwise, I have to switch okay. the screens okay, the whole no, time. No but uh, basically, uh, what I see is uh, it's it's a website with a whole story, and as uh, I have to look for the information I need, it's not very. Uh, how shall I say this? Friendly. Yeah. So it's a bit it's interesting, right? So for me, that conversation or that problem that the customer has, what, what you have here right now, what we have here right now, could be solved or resolved within the chat interface, right? I don't need to go to a website, and I could ask like further questions and then I maybe pinpoint really to one section, but you get here a quite generic link, right? International travel money car. So there will be a lot of information that's totally irrelevant to what you actually want. And I think a chatbot could do yeah. much better here. Well, uh, it, start, it starts with that you get no chance to explain what you exactly. actually want. It doesn't exactly. explore. Um, and if uh, I agree with you, if you would have asked me, what do you want with the global, uh, global money th thing? And the answer is, I, I would like to transfer money to a different yeah. country. Uh, that's a very concrete question and you give a, can give a, a very concrete yeah. answer. Um, and these are the steps you have to take either in the app or in online banking or whatever. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and, uh, you know, what is interesting, it's, um, if you're visually impaired, then what? Yeah, out of the, out of the game, sadly, anyways, right? Well, let me see if I can get what happens if I say I want to talk to an agent. Let's see what it does. Is it, uh, so I typed agent, see what it does. And, and it understands it's what you like to chat with one of our team. Uh, no, I want to call. Let's see what it does. Here, yeah, this is, uh, that's, that's funny. Did you see that? So I ask him, uh, uh, this is annoying. The messages are too long and they're sending, oh, stop. <laughs> they're sending too many. Uh, so I said, I, I want to call. And then it says, uh, sorry, I haven't been able... 
This is annoying. I haven't been able to help with your query today. The easiest way to resolve this is to chat with us via our mobile banking app. But if I'm not a customer, how can I chat through a mobile banking app? The app lets you manage your accounts easily and securely from a time and place that suits you. They never ask me if I'm a customer or not. So they don't know. If you prefer, you can contact us here via the telephone banking team. So this is good. Uh, with uh, this, I find this also very good. UK call and outside of yep. UK, so they're clear on how to reach them. A lot of companies don't do that. If you like to download or our app or need to help help with our app, uh, follow the link. Uh, I'm always here if you need me. I'm going to send you a short survey. Please fill this in. Uh, thanks for chatting. Please tell us how we did today or select skip survey. Um, so the funny thing is they didn't ask me if they could do anything else for me. They just completed the, the chat. They said, this is it. Thank you. So what the hell? Oh, and then it moves back to the top automatically. I don't know why it does that. Um, so what do you th think if, if you would summarize uh, uh, yeah. this bot? Um, slightly below average experience, you can call it. <laughs> Um, I think yeah, a lot of improvement capabilities, even in English, right, where we have super accurate NLU models, there's really no reason why not to dig deeper into the problem of the customer. It, it's really just like another interface where, like, first of all, you make customers most likely unhappy because it's really like superficial and not solving the problem. Um, and we didn't ask for like super complicated, right? We didn't ask for the latest state, a bank statement of an account that we don't own or something. We asked just about how can we Simple transfer stuff. Uh, <clears throat> so yeah, it's, it's not that great overall. Uh, and the funny thing is on the top, it now says yeah. error. And I have no <laughs> idea why. Uh, so yeah. Um, okay. So, um, um, We'll stop sharing this one. Um, I have another one. Um, uh, let me open that one. Uh, and it's uh, an insurance company, also British. I thought uh, I'll take, sure. a, we'll pick something that is in the country you currently live in, uh, so that if they think they can do better, they can call <laughs> okay. you and you can go and help them. Um, this is, um, uh, you can see it, right? No, not yet. It's, uh, you can't see it. Okay. Um, let me, uh, um, there it is. Now you can see yes. it. Okay. So we got here Diag Line. It's an insurance company and they have a virtual assistant here to get instant help. And it says here, hi, uh, it's at the bottom of a uh, uh, contact us page. Um, and it, so it doesn't pop up. It, it's, it's, it's resonant there. It's sort of, it looks like an iframe type of thing. Uh, hi, I'm the direct line virtual assistant. Let's get you started by selecting one of our most popular topics below or in a few words, tell me what you need help with today. Interesting. The previous one had a name and this one is just, uh, I'm a virtual assistant. It's, it's functional. Yeah. Um, so, um, it gives us two options. Either we can click something, add a remote, move a driver, charge, change my vehicle. I need my insurance certificate, need help with my renewal. How do I update or change my policy? Or, uh, we can type in a few words, what we need help with today. It doesn't restrict, here's the interesting, it doesn't restrict what we can or cannot ask. I mean, it's about car insurance, but it doesn't tell me. So I would like to know, um, um, my car is uh, 20 years old, which coverage insurance coverage do I need? Is a normal question, yep. right? Okay. My car is. So I'm asking for advice. I know it's a diag writer, but let's see what it does. Okay. Um, it says now as an answer, please select an option below or trying, uh, try asking me your question in a different way. So basically it says, I have no clue what you said, but now it, answer, it gives me the options. Can I drive abroad? I want a quote. I can't see my policies on my online account, but that's not what I asked. Um, I asked, uh, what do I need? 
Um, so I'll ask him, can you give me advice? Advice. Oh. I'm sorry. So, uh, you so see how bad this is? Bit, the, 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 it, right? It's, it's, yeah, there's this thing, you, you hardly see yeah, it here, yeah. it's gray. So in terms of coloring, this is, sorry, it's not really good. Um, it says, I'm sorry, my suggestions weren't helpful. Perhaps you'll find one of these popular topics helpful. Or if I still un didn't understand you, please contact customer service. This is interesting. This is, this is good practice. Uh, two strikes uh, and the chatbot is out. That's basically what's happening okay. here. Uh, so if the second uh, try of the chatbot uh, is not spot on, um, then uh, I need to contact customer services. But, How do um, I contact? I won't. How do I contact customer services? I'm going to ask that. But the other, the, the point is making some of the information in my policy documents is wrong. How do I have to update or make a change to my policy? And the window is really too small. I have a question about my payments. Contact customer services. So it's here. Let's see what it does. Oh my God. Um, so I ask contact customer services, now it answers, please confirm which insurance policy you'd like to discuss with us today. So I say car insurance. Um, oh my God. Uh, and then it says, please click the button below to send us a message. A person will be with you shortly. This is very confusing. So I can message them and the person will be with me sh shortly. If you're out and about, or you'd rather not wait at your computer for a reply, why not take advantage of our WhatsApp service? This is interesting. They do a crossover. Just open your phone's camera, point it at the QR code below, and wait for your phone to recognize the code and display a link. Tap the link on your phone, open secure. So there's a QR code here, which I can scan and then go into a conversation uh, with the line on WhatsApp. So they're, they're transferring the conversation to WhatsApp. Um, and that is interesting because um, we all know that uh, in terms of safety, uh, privacy sensitive stuff you don't want to do on WhatsApp. No. So I'm, uh, I'm a bit confused here. Very confusing. <laughs> it's pointing me in a different direction. <clears throat> I don't, there was message answer which is a field um, and then, yeah. It's a bit tricky to see. I think when you even click on message answer, I don't know what happens then, right? I have no Maybe. idea. Oh, then another chatbot. Maybe. <laughs> You're chatting to the right line. Huh? This is the second chatbot now. So hold on. We go from one virtual assistant to... to um, chatbot, yeah. So I'll ask, are you a bot? Sorry, um, for the people who are listening, uh, another chatbot screen opened next to the other chatbot screen. This is really confusing. Are you a chatbot? Uh, uh, I'll just ask it. Oh my God, sorry. This, you see this? Another bot. Yeah, they, they welcome to the line. Our insurance policies are underwritten by UK insurance, blah, 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 blah. Please answer all questions accurately, honestly, blah, 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 oh, um, or uh, incorrect or incomplete information could affect or invalidate your cover, reduce the amount we pay or stop any claim or being paid. Information givers may be used to prevent fraud and money laundering. Just to let you know, our consultants are likely to receive a bonus if you purchase any cover with us. Well, that is very encouraging. Yeah. Uh, welcome to the, uh, hello, welcome to the direct line messaging bot to get you through to an agent who can help. I just have a few quick questions. Okay, so this is the, the like the, the sort of a triage bot, skipping from one bot to the other, preparing me for to talk to an agent. This is too much work. It's, so either of the two chatbot companies, <coughs> they must have phenomenal salesperson because they managed to sell direct line a chatbot, although they already have a chatbot. Um, so they have done. Uh, well, <laughs> you see this. Uh, hold on. I'm, I'm, I'm connecting now to someone named Ankita okay. or not. Maybe the chatbot is named Ankita. I, I don't know. Uh, it says here, uh, your message has been, just to let you know that this 
Okay. Just to let you know this, that this isn't an instant messaging service. Okay. And then it says your message has been placed in the queue and an agent will respond to you as quickly as possible. Uh, we aim to reply within five minutes, but this may take up to 15 minutes during busy periods. Please feel free to provide any additional information you think is useful. Uh, your patience is appreciated, or opening hours are. Uh, so I'm going to ask, can I call? Um, uh, the, 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 uh, I've seen quite a few chatbots and web pages with chatbots on it. This is the most confusing app to now, <laughs> one next to the other. What do you think? Yeah, it's yeah, not really sort of the user experience overall. I don't know, like, technically it cannot be that constraining to build what you have on the right, having a part of the chatbot on the left, right? So it's, yeah, I don't know why they guide users to another window. And the other thing is uh, they do it in red. Yeah. Uh, so, okay, good afternoon. You're through to Ankita. I hope you're doing good. Could you please confirm your query? I will help you here. Um, they totally ignored my, my question, can I call? And I asked in the other chatbot, can I call? And that actually gives me, the uh, virtual assistant, they give me the phone number yeah. I can call. Okay. But they give me the local phone number, not the international one. Uh, and then they refer back again to the WhatsApp service. Um, what do you think about the red, uh, that the fact that they call it this red, this chatbot? Yeah, it doesn't. What does that it's like do? It's an alarming signal to me, right? And I don't think it fits into the color scheme of all of the company. Very, maybe a little bit. It well, yeah. it's the same red. The, so that, yeah. I think... Uh, Someone used the style yeah, guide, yeah. guide to design the chatbot. Uh, these are our colors, so we need to do that. I think psychologically, yeah. um, in terms of user friendliness, don't make a chatbot in red. Yeah. Uh, it comes across very aggressive, if, in my yeah. opinion. Oh, yeah. I don't know. I, totally agree. Um, I don't think we should go into uh, uh, a discussion with uh, Ankita. Um, thanks. But no thanks. Because um, uh, I, I don't want to engage her in a discussion. Um, I, I think we can safely say that this could use some uh, <clears throat> improvement. Right? Yeah, totally. Um, uh, I'll stop sharing because uh, uh, I don't think it gets any better for by keeping it on the, on the screen. Um, would you say that um, um, it, it, no? Let me put it differently. In the UK, there's a lot of international or uh, um, people that speak different languages. I mean, there's lots of refugees. There's there's uh, a lot of people that speak Hindi or another Indian language. Uh, or many other languages. So if you look at this, and then your passion, so what do you see? What do you feel? Yeah, quite, I think it could be quite intimidated, intimidating experience for someone who's not very familiar with the language, right? Because they probably think in the first instance, oh, I do something wrong. Something happens here, I do something wrong. Um, I need to, I need to. It's my mistakes that I don't get through to anyone. It's my, my mistakes that I don't get my problem resolved. But in fact, it's, it's really poor user experience, really poor user design. And yeah, it just could be a lot better. In both instances, in the, in the second one, um, there was all that switching of windows, which was very confusing. But even in the first instance, um, we could have yeah, utilized the capabilities the technologies have already uh, to be a lot more inclusive. So, and now we realize these are two big uh, British corporations. They're not small, they're big. Um, and, and knowing that they're big, then, and looking at this, I'm like, this is not at the level um, that, that is um, becoming of a big company like, like themselves. It's the same when we tested Virgin Atlantic. Uh, I was in shock. Um, what the level of the chatbot. And here, same, actually, the, these are huge companies. They, they have, I assume, um, professional teams working on this. 
Um, so I, I'm just wondering, I don't have the answer, but I'm wondering, is, is it the tech stack or is it uh, uh, limitations of the team or lack of vision? Um, that, that could also be a problem. I, I don't know. I don't have the answer. Actually, I'm, I'm getting an answer from direct line. Let me see. Um, oh, she's actually sending us a, a phone number and a, a way to connect and uh, no problem. So that, that's kind. Um, if we would, if you would, if you could give some uh, uh, advice or tips to not necessarily these companies, but uh, on the one hand, conversation designers, and on the other hand, to platform developers, so people that are building platforms. We named a few earlier, earlier but there are quite a few on the market. Um, what, what would your advice be for the near future? Yeah, yeah there, there's a lot of, lot of things I would, I would like to see. Um, T take yeah, your time. One, We're recording. One is definitely uh, that they think more about expanding the number of languages, just in terms of being actually proactive um, in providing that support for people who are not that familiar in speaking, uh, speaking the, the national language. That's in every country in Europe, I think that's a, that's a need and it would just be the next level of support for people um, who may, yeah, don't speak, just don't speak the native language, right, uh, of the country. And they have, a, anyways, in most, in most cases, they have a struggling, struggling experience in that country. So why not at least being there a bit of proactive and trying to uh, make it easier for them to, whatever, just open a bank account, get some certificate, get some, um, I don't know, a license to, to do whatever, right, a, a driving license or something like that. So there could be could be a lot done um, in terms of, of a, a beautiful example yeah. is the Ukrainians yeah. that that are all over yes. Europe now. Um, I don't know if Ukrainian is in your uh, in your system. It is, yeah. But uh, how nice would it have been to integrate? Yeah, that? totally. So there were some um, organizations. One I know it's called Clear Global. It's an NGO uh, that used to be called Translators Without Borders, and what they it is just like a basic information, um, an app essentially for Ukrainians um, who came to Germany, I believe. And just like, what can I, where can I find housing information? Where can I find whatever, opening a bank account and all of these kind of first arrival immediate questions. Um, and it was quite helpful, I think, to lots of people um, to just get some advice. Sort of first aid for refugees. Somewhat, yeah, like an information, right? An information portal how to do certain things in a new country where they didn't know a week ago that they would go there, right? So they have basically no preparation yeah. time. So for, for platform de developers, you would say, okay, please, you know, start thinking about including uh, multiple languages or the possibility for multiple languages and, and instant translations. Um, and for conversation designers, what would you tell them? Well, they, they need to utilize the technology that is then available on the platforms. Um, I would try to exploit that technology as much as possible, so exploit the capabilities of, in that instance, what we saw just now, um, having accurate instant classification, right? Or having accurate entity recognition. So let's just design a flow for users that are, first of all, intuitive for them, are human-like, and let's not build only that 10 stories and with clicking and with giving me all the information I need to read everything. Um, let's really try to build advanced solutions that feel human-like. So basically that feel human-like because they ask me, they, they, they try to understand me properly and uh, preferably also in my native yeah. tongue. That's exactly. the, the other one. So it's, it's the combination yeah. of the both, it's not just one. That is uh, um, actually quite helpful. Um, uh, and I hope that the, the platform builders and designers and the conversation designers, that, that sort of comes together yeah. because if one builds it in their platform and the other one starts using it, then there's a use and a business case yeah. for it. Um, and, and hopefully then uh, chatbots uh, and conversational AI becomes a little bit more inclusive. Um, and I think then 
And only then, uh, which is my passion, how do we get from a, a conversation to a transaction? Because what I see is that uh, also in these uh, uh, bots, that they, they, they're sending information, but um, uh, I want something. So if you have a conversation with me, we can quickly go into a transaction because you give me the information I need and that answers my question and then we can move on. But I, I see most chatbots, they, 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 they get stuck in sending information yep. and getting that right and they never get to the, or very hard, uh, very difficult, uh, put themselves in a difficult spot to get to the transaction. And um, I think that that's a waste of uh, resources uh, and also of, the, of my time as a consumer because uh, I would like to go from A to B as quick as possible. And um, um, you know what? I, I wish there was a, some sort of, I don't know, testing or result uh, where you can check that this, where you have use cases and you can sort of use that as an overlay over chatbots and where you can see how fast this chatbot helps you from A to B. So you get some sort of customer service, customer effort rating um, where you could, you know, there's an international s a scoreboard of chatbots where this chatbot gets me from A to B uh, um, quickest. Um, I don't know, it's not out there. I, I, don't, I have no idea how to do it, um, but I would be amazed because uh, uh, then you get like best practices and, uh, and understand what works and what people like. Um, but I haven't seen it. No, I, haven't. I don't know if you, if you have. Well, well, maybe we should uh, uh, <laughs> create it. No, but um, um, I think the the, the 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 essence of the story today is that inclusivity is uh, we should not wait with inclusivity, and and change uh, the way we work right now. That goes for platforms and conversation designers, um, because otherwise we we sort of miss the customer service boat, as we would say in, in Dutch, um, and or or train. Um, and, and basically the, the chatbot and conversation now loses its power, whereas it has all the potential to be huge in scalability and, and customer service and uh, um, making lives easier. Um, any last thought you want to share? No, we covered, we covered uh, for lots. today. Last short thought for uh, today. Yeah, I, I found really interesting that we spoke a lot about inclusivity, but it has in, in essence also means fairness, accessibility um, to a lot more than just a chatbot, right? So when we think about education or knowledge, accessibility, it has been like, yeah, transformative, um, transformative consequences when, when something like that is properly implemented. Um, yeah, I think it's it's worth an effort, and I wish a lot more people will, would work on would work on that and. Um, people would be a lot more open and willing to actually explore some of these technologies. Uh, but yeah, it's a fascinating field. We're still at the very beginning of, of reaching the peak, I would say. Um, I'm very excited about the next couple of years. Yeah, it's a great journey, but we're not at our final destination yeah, exactly. yet, right? Well, uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Felix. I, I really enjoyed our talk and I hope this uh, uh, podcast um, helps spreading the idea and the thought of inclusivity in chatbots and that uh, conversation designers and platform developers and owners alike uh, will think about uh, um, including multiple languages and, and um, language as a, or, or translations as a service in their platforms and in the design of the, the chatbots. And I think when that starts happening, um, we will quickly see changes uh, uh, all around and, and things getting better, uh, I would assume. So thank you very much for today and we'll keep a close eye on you and your company, see what's happening. And if there's huge developments, uh, you know, call us and um, we'll discuss them. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you very much. Thanks.